an unusual location for the sky at night. It's three o'clock in the morning, and we're at Talmine in North Scotland, waiting for the annular eclipse of the sun. And with me are three very wrinkled with visitors of the sky at night, Ian Nicholson, Dr. Steve Wainwright, and Dr. Brian May. Yes, it really is the great guitarist. Some people forget he's also the highly qualified astronomer. And now for tonight's main event, the annular eclipse of the sun, when the moon passes in front of the sun and is not quite big enough to cover it, and therefore a ring of sunlight's left showing around the dark body of the moon. Interesting and won't happen again for a long time. Well, Leon, uh, we all got our own programmes. What are you going to do particularly? Well, I think uh, what's, what I'm going to do is just watch this thing visually because it's going to be quite a dramatic event for two reasons. One is that it's uh, taking place immediately after sunrise, so the sun will be coming up uh, as a dramatically thin crescent and then growing to annularity. It should be reddened uh, by the, the atmosphere. And the other thing is that because it's so close to the, uh, the horizon, atmospheric refraction is going to distort the sun and make it look rather like a, a squashed oval rather than a complete circle. So that, that'll be quite an exciting thing to see. It certainly will. Now, Steve, uh, if we do have clouds, you're, you're rather hoping to see through them, aren't you? Yes, I am. I, I'm hoping to capture everything that, that Ian has just described. But with the infrared sensitivity of the video camera that I'm going to try, I'm hoping that if we have clouds that, that might visually obscure it and spoil it for you, mm -hmm. that maybe we'll still be able to see it on the video cameras. Well, Brian, you have your program too. My program is just to be here and observe, really. I, I think in previous eclipses I've sometimes spent too much time fiddling around with equipment and sort of felt that I missed the event, so I'll just observe and... Uh, I, I brought a video camera, but I'll just leave it running and uh, absorb the event, I think. And of course, we depend entirely upon a really clear horizon. Whether there are yeah. clouds there at the moment, let's hope they clear away. The eclipse isn't the only interesting event of this month. We already had a transit of Mercury. Now Mercury, a little world, is closer to the sun than we are and goes around the sun once in 88 days. There are therefore times when it passes in front of the sun and is seen as a tiny black spot in transit. It doesn't happen very often because Mercury's orbit is tilted and generally it misses. But this month it did happen and we actually saw it. I saw it from my home in Sosie and I took this picture. See a sunspot there and the tiny black spot of Mercury. You can see Mercury is blacker than the sunspot. But I've had far better pictures than that. Here is one from Peter Pace in Ireland. You can see there, as Mercury comes onto the sun's disk, a, a series of beautiful pictures. Then, a good one from uh, David Evans. Again, we see the spot and the little world of Mercury. And one from Jamie Cooper, who also had a good view. The second thing was a total eclipse of the moon. And that I fear, from our point of view, was disappointing, because almost the whole of Britain was clouded out. Martin Bobberley did get a view of the early stages, but even then, cloud troubled him too. As you know, the moon is eclipsed when it goes into the cone of shadow cast by the Earth, the supply of sunlight's cut off, and the moon turns a dim, rusty colour before it passes out of the shadow again. Nevertheless, there will be another eclipse of the moon in November, so we can look forward to that. You know, Ian, the thing that impressed me about the Mercury transit was how tiny Mercury appeared. You saw it, didn't you? I saw it intermittently between clouds, uh, just in a, a very amateur sort of way. But of course, there was an intense amount of interest amongst the professional community in looking at this event as well. It's not that rare. It's not uh, of exceptional scientific importance. But uh, we did get some uh, very nice images, for example, from the, the Gong group, the uh, Global Oscillation yes. Network group. And they, in particular from their Indian site, got a very nice sequence of uh, images uh, dotting Mercury's progress right across the face of the Sun. As you say, it's a very tiny little dot. Uh, and then again, of course, the, the, the Swedish one-meter telescope and La Palma really got some outstanding images. And uh, what was particularly interesting there was to see uh, this uh, quite large image of Mercury yes. progressing 
towards the edge or, or limb of the solar disk. And they've got a very nice uh, sequence that shows it right to the last little bite of uh, Mercury that's visible. And then, of course, from space, the, the SOHO spacecraft was looking at that as well. And uh, again, they got a whole sequence of images which made rather nice movie showing this, this progress of the, the planet across the disk rather nicely. So really, uh, it's, it's of immense interest in that sense. But, but of um, course, next year we have the transit of Venus. Indeed we do, and of course, uh, the transit of Venus oh, yeah. was uh, of tremendous importance uh, historically in trying to measure the, the distance between the Earth and the Sun, the astronomical unit. Uh, there hasn't been one since 1882, so in a sense, uh, this Mercury transit has been a nice dry run for the uh, really exciting event for next year. Yes, in uh, 2012, another, another transit of Venus, and then no more for over a century. Indeed. They really are rare. Uh, so, though, Steve, you have got results from your group and also from the eclipse of the Moon. That's right, yes, we've got, um, we've got nice results. We show what amateurs can, can manage to do. We have some nice white light images which show, as you said, Mercury very small against the disk of the, of the Sun. Um, we also have some images, interestingly, taken in hydrogen alpha light. And um, one of these images shows Mercury against the background of the Sun. You can see the granularity on the surface of the Sun. And we have another image which Mercury is not visible on this because this was showing the other side of the Sun, but we've got some very nice prominences visible there. And we've also got a really nice set of of still images of the progress of the lunar eclipse and that's been turned into a little movie as well. So, you know, they're really quite good and it shows what amateurs can do and these were all taken by members of the QC UAG unconventional imaging group. Well, thank you, Steve. It does show what amateurs can do. And now, of course, they range much further, right out across the galaxy. Gamma ray bursters, immensely violent, immensely remote. I talked to Dr. Niall Tandia the University of Hertfordshire. Well, Niall, um, welcome to the sky at night. Gamma ray bursts have been known since the 1960s, but why the sudden surge of interest now? You're right. Gamma ray bursts were discovered, in fact, in 1967, but for 30 years, we didn't even know how far away they were. Then in 1997, the first distance was measured. We found out that actually gamma ray bursts are coming from the other side of the universe, in effect which makes them the, the biggest and most violent explosions that we know about. So since then, in the last few years, there's been a great deal of interest trying to study them and understand what on earth gives rise to these enormously violent outbursts. Before we go on to how they burst, what exactly are gamma rays? Gamma rays are the highest energy forms of light. So as you know, light comes the electromagnetic spectrum in many different flavors, starting from the very low energy radio waves through the visible but then on to much higher energy forms of light where each individual photon can be very energetic. That takes you into the X-ray region and then ultimately into the gamma ray region. Why did it take so long to make that first distance measurement? The problem is that gamma ray bursts, as the name implies, their, their main characteristic is that they're, they're flashes of gamma rays. Now, these gamma rays don't penetrate the Earth's atmosphere, so it wasn't until the first satellites were launched that were able to detect these high-energy photons. Which were they? Those were the, the, they were called the Vela satellites. They were launched by uh, the US. In fact, they were military satellites. Yes, I remember. So they were designed to look for evidence of nuclear explosions that uh, were, were being tested in space, possibly. They got them. <laughs> well, indeed they did, um, but not by... Uh, not in the, the way they, th they thought they were going to. These obviously weren't uh, nuclear bombs. These were, as we now know, explosions happening uh, very, very far away. Um, but the problem is you don't learn a great deal from the gamma rays. You can't tell how far away they are. You can only get a very rough idea of where uh, the, the gamma rays are even coming from in the sky. So it wasn't until a, a satellite was launched, in fact it was called the beppo sachs satellite in 96, and beppo sachs was different from previous satellites in that it was able to take a very fuzzy X-ray picture at the same time as it was detecting the gamma rays. With that fuzzy X-ray picture, you could get a reasonably good location in the sky, you could turn big ground-based telescopes into, in that direction and make the first optical images. Of course, Bifo has just come down, hasn't it? That's right. It's the end of a, a, what's turned out to be a remarkably successful mission, of course, because it's made such a huge impact on the, uh, the gamma-ray burst field. It wasn't what it was mainly intended to do. It was a bit of a spin-off, yeah. but in fact it's been, of course, a huge success. You say they're a long way away. That is certainly true, but how far? 
The record at the moment for a gamma ray burst uh, was one that happened three or four years ago and it was about 95% of the way to the edge of the observable universe. And so we've seen them really all the way between here and there. Um, There's the thousands of millions of light years. That's right. Now, the $64,000 question now, what is a gamma ray burst? What causes it? I wish I knew, but uh, so they are still pretty mysterious things. What I can tell you is what we have learnt about them. Since 97, we've learnt when they occur, they, they're explosions which are occurring in very distant galaxies. This always seems to be the case. They seem to always be occurring in galaxies where there are, where there's formation of new stars going on, and also we think massive stars are dying. Starburst galaxies, in fact. Frequently it is a starburst galaxy. M82, things like that? M82 would be a very good local uh, yeah. candidate, uh, uh, the sort of galaxy that we see at high redshift that, that produces these things. So we, we think there's a, an association with the deaths of massive stars, and we, we know from previous work that when massive stars die, some of them explode as supernovae, of yes. course, as you know. The idea is that the star collapses internally, but remarkably that implosion internally produces an explosion uh, of the outer parts of the star. What we now think is that in some cases, very extreme cases, a jet of matter is produced from this internal implosion, which, and it's that jet which gives rise to the gamma ray burst, and the jet sort of fires out um, each side of the star, and if you happen to be looking along that jet, if it's heading right towards you, then you see a gamma-ray burst. And the gamma-ray burst is much brighter, in fact, than the supernova explosion, which is going on at the same time. There was a theory that a DRB was due to a collision of two neutron stars, wasn't there? There was. And the reason that that model was developed, really, was to just explain the huge power output. You can imagine if you fire two neutron stars at each other, you liberate an awful lot of energy. So that used to be the favourite model throughout the 1990s. I think we've been forced by the observations to, to consider this sort of uh, model of the collapsing massive star, which is much more like a traditional supernova. We've been forced there because uh, uh, of the evidence that we've gathered. It wasn't what astronomers expected, but it now seems that that certainly is the best explanation for the majority of gamma ray bursts that we see, essentially because we've now seen some gamma ray bursts which seem to be associated with supernova type events, so we actually see the two things happening at the same time. Well, we know they are immensely powerful, but, but how powerful precisely? Depends how you'd like to measure it. Yeah. Uh, in terms of other objects that you see in the sky, the brightest objects that you normally see in the universe are the most powerful quasars. At their peak, gamma ray bursts are as luminous as a, something like a thousand of the most, uh, the brightest quasars. So that's an incredibly intense uh, luminosity, but of course it only lasts for a short period of time. So they, they really sort of uh, li live fast, die young. When they get a GRB, gamma ray burst, what is actually happening? We don't know for sure, but our best guess at the moment is that the core of a massive star collapses probably to form a black hole, but just in the process of forming the black hole, it seems to generate a jet of highly relativistic material. So what we're seeing here is a jet of material being ejected from the core of the star. It's a false color image, of course, but as the camera, the view, zooms back, you see the jet bursting out of the surface of the star. And the idea is that if you happen to be looking along that jet, then you see the gamma ray burst. How luminous are these things? I know they're tremendously bright. That's right. We have seen a whole range of brightnesses, but the, the record holder so far is one that went off in 1999, and at its peak it was something like a thousand times brighter than the brightest quasars that we know of. And so uh, that's phenomenally bright. In fact, that particular burst became so bright even in the optical, and most of the radiation is in the gamma ray region rather than the optical, but even in the optical it reached magnitude 9, despite being at a redshift of 1.6, which is three quarters of the way across the universe. So uh, if you'd had a good pair of binoculars in a, in a dark location, you might have been able to see that burst. But how long did they last? The gamma rays themselves last only a few minutes, typically this flash of gamma rays that initiates the whole thing. The afterglow, which we can see with optical telescopes and even radio telescopes, lasts 
certainly days, and in fact, if you look faint enough, for instance, with the Hubble Space Telescope, we've been able to see some of these afterglows fading away even months uh, after. One thing strikes me, you don't know when these things are going to occur or where, therefore amateurs, I suppose, could find them. Exactly right. The way that it currently works is that the gamma ray detecting satellites beam the positions very rapidly to the ground. They're disseminated over the internet via email, mobile phones. Um, they're received by many professional observers, but now amateurs are receiving this information as well in a matter of minutes sometimes from the burst going off. So if it's dark, if they're out observing, well, that's perfect. They can train their telescope within a few minutes and perhaps get the first observation of a gamma ray burst. Of course, these things, remote though they are, are so bright that they come now within the range of well-equipped amateurs. For example, John Fletcher down in Droster uh, took these pictures with a 10-inch reflector, and they're pretty good. So amateurs are now in the general network. It's one of the great things about gra gamma ray burst research is that these things are indeed so bright that they can be seen with small telescopes, especially when they're equipped with electronic CCD cameras. The first observations made by any observers in the UK were made actually last October. Um, a particularly bright burst, it was discovered by, uh, uh, the afterglow was discovered by observers in the west coast of America. By the time, therefore, a few hours later it became dark in Britain, we knew exactly where to look and a whole bunch of people managed to take observations. That one faded, it was at about eight or nine hours after the burst, faded down to magnitude 18 or so, but that is still possible. Yeah. The burst in March this year was even more extreme. That one is one of the very nearest bursts that we've ever seen. How near? It's a, a distance of about 3,000 million light years, so it doesn't seem quite on our doorstep, but it's still relatively near by gamma ray burst standards. And for that reason, it remained bright, brighter than, or 15th, 16th magnitude for quite some time after the burst went off. So it was really, um, in fact, very easy for, for um, small telescopes for several days to observe that burst. And of course, amateur observations are really variable here. They are. Because gamma ray bursts are so unpredictable and because they fade so fast, we really like to get lots of data, as much as we can, for, from those very early times, as, as soon after the burst as possible. And just depending on where it goes off in the sky, where, which part of the Earth it, it's nighttime, which part is daytime, it means all the observations, as many observers as we can get, um, they're all valuable. And so even the, the amateur observations can produce very useful scientific results. Well, when a GRB appears, it's fairly easy to notify the main observers. But what about the amateurs, people like, like John Fletcher and Gordon Rogers? Because of the way it's set up, these, the alerts for gamma ray bursts are sent out over the internet. And if you sign up to receive those alerts, you can receive them by email. You can receive the email perhaps on your mobile phone like I do. And therefore, in principle, thousands of observers around the world can all uh, take part in, in these hunts and these searches. What do you think is the next step in gamma ray burst research? At the end of this year, a new satellite is scheduled for launch called the SWIFT satellite, and it's SWIFT by name, and the hope is it'll be SWIFT by nature. The idea is that it can locate many more gamma ray bursts than we've previously seen, provide the positions very rapidly, beam them uh, to the ground, and with the SWIFT satellite, we're hoping to be able to study large numbers and do statistical studies of gamma ray bursts for the first time. We're also hoping maybe to see a few exceptional events. Um, one thing we're hoping to do is to find the most distant object that's ever been seen. Because gamma ray bursts are so bright, if there are any taking place in the very early universe, then we should be able to see them and swift, if it provides their positions, should uh, allow us to do that. Makes our system look very small, doesn't it? It does indeed, and I think one of the uh, very interesting things about gamma ray bursts in general is that because they're so bright, it, it sort of uh, really emphasizes the, the whole range with which uh, you can see across the universe from relatively nearby objects to these objects which cover large uh, fractions of the universe. And lastly, your own particular research, um, what equipment are you using and what are you actually doing at the moment? The professional astronomers which, who work on gamma ray bursts tend to make use of a lot of, of uh, facilities all the way around the world. In fact, not only on the Earth, but above the Earth as well. We use big 
telescopes, big optical telescopes, radio telescopes, we use the Hubble Space Telescope. And in fact, it's only by bringing together this wide range of different facilities that we're able to gather enough data to, uh, to, to make progress with understanding gamma ray bursts. Because they decay so rapidly, you can't really afford to, to just use one telescope to do this job. You have to use a lot of different telescopes, a lot of different instrumentation. And, uh, of course, you can't always be there. In fact, you're usually not. You usually sit in your office at home, and when the alert comes through, it's then a matter of getting on the phone, sending out the emails to the various uh, big telescopes that can make useful observations for you. You send them the information, and then you sit and try and uh, gather it all together and make some sense of it. The universe is full of surprises. Niall, thank you very much. So with amateurs playing an important part, let me reintroduce now one of our regular visitors, Gordon Rogers, a very well-equipped amateur who's been having a go at GRBs. The Crendon Observatory uh, uh, adjoins my house and comprises um, a, uh, an ash dome in which I house a 16-inch uh, Mead uh, telescope on which rides a 5-inch uh, Takahashi refractor. Uh, imaging I do with uh, a Santa Barbara Group uh, ST10 camera. And you see this very fine photograph of the GRB, which is pretty faint. You never, you're never quite sure with these GRBs whether you're going to get them. No. Uh, that uh, you know Guy Hurst. I do indeed. The president of the British Astronomical Association. And you know that he runs the uh, UK and European Supernova Patrol. In addition, he sends out alerts about uh, interesting events in the sky to his the team on his panel. And on the uh, 29th of March this year, he sent out an alert about a GRB uh, in true form. That, uh, that night we were clouded out, heavy cloud, no chance to image it, so bye-bye, GRB. Naturally. Uh, the following night, he emailed again to say that, surprisingly, this particular GRB uh, was persisting more than normal. Uh, it was relatively close at only about uh, 2 billion light years. And would the team try again? So point the telescope at uh, the coordinates he'd given in Leo. Uh, and I took uh, three 10-minute images at high resolution, put them together in the computer, and found I had a picture with uh, uh, some stars in our galaxy and some distant galaxies. There were several of these distant faint galaxies towards the center of the image, and any one of those could have been the GRB. I had no way of knowing because no chart would go that I have would go that uh, that deep. Uh, so you only uh, have you got it or not? Send it off to Guy Hurst and await uh, the outcome. The following day, uh, NASA uh, sent uh, out uh, in their messages. They sent out an image of the GRB, which had been obtained in Japan, and it was quite pleasing to see that. Uh, one of my uh, little smudges was, in fact, the GRB. Very well done indeed. I should tell you, though, that uh, at a previous attempt, uh, Guy sent out an alert, and uh, I set everything up, imaged the uh, bit of sky, sky in question, and uh, sent off the result to Guy, and uh, he emailed back and said, uh, very nice picture, Gordon, but uh, wrong bit of sky. <laughs> Congratulations, Gordon. It's now half past three. We are still waiting for the rising of the sun, and I wonder, I begin to see it. There's quite a crowd here, astronomers and onlookers, and we are all hoping those clouds will clear away for the critical moments. I don't entirely like the look of that cloud, do you? It's just in the perfectly wrong place, isn't it? And the rest of the sky is beautiful, and just the one place we want to... There was a sporting chance, but if it's over to the left, the rabbit eye, and that's where the sun comes up. Yes, it, it's hard to know how transparent it is, isn't it? I mean, we might see it through there. It's very we might, because after the sun hasn't, hasn't risen yet, it may, it may burn the clouds up, this way. Mm, we can hope. We can hope. Yes. At least one thing we show, we'll see the partial phase later. Certainly, certainly. Energy we want. Yes, it would be nice. Yeah. Got about two, two minutes. Two minutes to go. Two minutes and counting. Yeah. You can definitely see that... Uh, patch I know. where the sun is illuminating it, moving to the right. I want to see um, it again. See it there. Any joy, Steve? No. no May I see it? Thing. I believe the sun is just behind there. Mm. Mm. 
One thing we can see is just how pale this light is. There's no doubt that we're near mid-eclipse, just looking at the quality of the light and the sort of eerie, eerie darkness and pale pastel shades. Well, it's right, it's right, because of the time we are near the cloudy total eclipse. It's kind of some kind of strange light. It is, isn't it? But I believe the sun is almost here. Yes, we're not you, you can almost see the sun. It's just through there, you can What's see that? it. It's very, very close. Any joy, Steve? Close. Any joy, Steve? I think we've got it, actually, here. Yeah. yeah, we have it. Anything? We've no, got it, Patrick, no. yeah. Oh, it's there. Yes. You can see it. There, the annual eclipse. We're just getting it directly now, Patrick. Yep. See very, very faint on, under the light patch. Under the light patch. Yeah, it is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Oh, the partial phase coming through very nicely, a very thin crescent. Yes, indeed, we can see it quite clearly now. It's certainly dramatic, isn't it? It's got that look, look, look of a ring of fire on it. Um, now that's good because you can really get the impression that the disk of the moon is smaller than the, the disk of the sun, can't you? And that the curvature is different. Ah, oh, it really is quite beautiful. Yes, it really looks remarkably smaller than the, the sun the moon this time. It's worth seeing that. Hmm, certainly is. Well, we so nearly succeeded. The cloud was there, it was thinning all the time, we thought we might get it, we saw the glow of the sun, and then eventually the sun did come out just at the end of the anniversary. But luckily, both Steve and Brian got it by the end of it. Yeah. Well, that's right. We thought that the video cameras might be sensitive enough in the infrared for us to see it, and we, we did capture the full annularity, so we're pleased. And also yes. you did the same, didn't you? Yes, we'll have one for the sky at night, hopefully. We'll, well, we'll do a nice print of it, I'm sure. And Definitely. we saw it visually shortly afterwards. Amazing oh. how quickly the light came back. And now, of course, the, the sun is in a partially eclipsed, and you had hardly anything happening at all. It was very obvious, wasn't it, even in the partial phase, how, how much smaller the moon appeared than, than the sun itself, which, it of course, is what you would expect. So and even though we yeah. missed the main spectacle visually, at least it won't get into red, so I think we can say uh, the whole thing has been a success. Although Fantastic. it's immensely entertaining. It'll be a long, long time before it happens again. Yes. So, Brian, Ian, Steve, thank you very much indeed. Thank Next you, month, Patrick. something different. I'll be joined by Dr. Helen Walker, talking about the various space probes, including those being sent to Mars next month. Also, David Hardy will be here to announce the winner of our Mars Base competition. And also, don't forget our website, www.bbc.co.uk slash space. And so, from Scotland, at the end of our annual eclipse, for the moment, good night. <laughs>